Welcome, guys, to another episode of Journey to the Pit. I'm Jim Collins, and I'll be your host this evening. If this is your first time over here with Journey to the Pit, what we do over here is we interview game fowl breeders from literally all over the world. They come on the show and share their experiences and their journey and their life of game fowl, hoping that the information that they share can help you achieve your goals and your uh, within your program that you're doing. So tonight, guys, we have a very, very special guest, the first of of its kind, and why I say that is, is our special guest will be talking about a breed of game fowl that we have not had a special guest come on the show and talk about. So I'm very, very excited about it. Most of y'all guys know uh, him uh, from the Oriental side. Uh, also, too, we have posted up the flyer, did the promotion all week. So many of y'all guys are really, really looking forward to this interview. Um, again, guys, you know, don't be shy. Post in the comments any questions that you may have. Uh, so if we cannot get to them during the interview. We'll be able to get to the questions, you know, after the interview or over the weekend. So, guys, it's going to be a very, very awesome uh, interview. Like I said, I have received tons of questions about it. Um, I know it's a lot of American game fowl breeders out there that had a lot of interest in the oriental side of game fowl, but did not have a lot of experience or a lot of knowledge with it. So we thought it would be great to bring uh, this breeder on tonight. Jason Love was sent to Game Farms out of Georgia. We thought it'd be great to bring him on. Uh, he's not a big time breeder or anything like that but he has a lot of experience he's well connected in the oriental game fowl community from all over the world very very well known but just a small hobby breeder uh that is coming tonight to bring a lot a lot of great knowledge with us uh, we'll try to cover as much as we can but with this being the first time we're bringing on a game fowl breeder to talk about this breed it's probably going to be a two-part interview we'll just see what we can cover tonight guys y'all know these interviews go long they intended to go long. They long form educational interviews. So uh, y'all guys know what to expect. Hopefully y'all guys are nice and comfortable. Y'all got y'all coffee, y'all tea, y'all popcorn or whatever it takes, man, for y'all guys to sit here. Make sure your phones are charged up. Make sure your Wi-Fi is good. We're going to try to post this thing tonight, man. Make it exciting. Make it very informative. And again, guys, don't be shy about sharing. Uh, don't be shy about sh sharing the uh, interview. Please, please, please go ahead and share it if you're watching from uh, Journey to the Pit fan page. Um, if you're watching over there from YouTube, make sure you hit that red subscribe button and that notification button so you get notified once we posting up um, these uh, interviews. And see, we got guys already checking in. It seems like, like I say, this is going to be a great, great interview. We got guys checking in from all over the place. All over already. We got West Virginia in here. We got Kentucky in here. What's up, Richard? How you doing? We got Rogers in here. Bobby Rogers, what's up, brother, from up there in Oklahoma? So, guys, come on in. Check in. Let us know where you're, where you're checking in at. I hear you, Philippines. We got Mr. Carey, Don Carey out there in the Philippines. What's up, Pure Game? Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody's looking forward to this interview. It looks like we have a lot of people checking in. Brandon, we got Brandon checking in from St. Martin. What's up, brother? Uh, Corey, we got Corey in here. So we got everybody checking in, man. Um, like I say, man, we got the islands. The islands are really checking in. You know, uh, I know I, it's kind of surprising because a lot of times the guys from the islands, uh, British islands and Virgin Islands uh, are checking in from YouTube. But we got some checking in on Facebook tonight, which I, I think is awesome. Uh, we got Cali in the house, which which we knew Cali was definitely going to be in the house. South Carolina. We got Florida. We got Texas. North Carolina, Los Angeles, Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky. We got everybody checking in all over. Guys, continue those check-ins, man. We want to give our guests a warm welcome coming in. Um, and uh, like I say, guys, I think y'all are going to really, really enjoy this. You know, our special guest tonight um, had an opportunity to speak with him the other night. We had a very, very long talk, which I think was great. So I can get a really good understanding of, you know, what he was all about as far as a breeder to see what type of things or topics we can touch on that I think will be very, very beneficial to the game foul community here in the States, the American game foul uh, here in the States. So uh, we went over some topics, but again, I think this is going to be the first of uh, a few uh, interviews that we have set up. Our special guest tonight was kind enough to reach out to some of his contacts in the Oriental community and, uh, and line some future interviews up which I'm really, really looking forward to it because I think that would be a great opportunity for us to bridge the gap between just the American game foul and the Oriental game foul communities. We can really, really uh, bridge that gap because at the end of the day, we all share the same passion for these majestic animals and, uh, well, foul, 
you know, some people call them animals, but they're foul. Um, and uh, I think that'd be great. So tonight is going to be a very, very special uh, event as far as this interview, because like I say, this is the first Oriental Game Fire Breeder that we had on the show. But again, it'd be the first of many. We'll try to cover as many topics uh, as we can. Um, be patient, guys. Listen, I don't have a lot of knowledge on the Orientals. I will try to ask the best questions that I possibly can to get the best information out of them. Um, maybe some people might say I'm at a disadvantage because I don't have a knowledge, lot of knowledge on the, on the Orientals, but I think our special guests will be able to educate all of us and share a lot of additional information. So that's why it's important, guys, to share, uh, to post in the comment section if you do have questions. Um, because I'm not the only one that's going to come up with all the questions. If y'all guys got questions, ask those questions in the comment section. We'll try to get to them. And again, like I said, we cannot get to them tonight during the interview because, you know, they run long. Uh, our special guest tonight will get to them over the weekend or when he get time. So let's go ahead and put this disclaimer out here. All the information discussed in this interview is for historical educational and entertainment purposes only none of this information is intended for any illegal purposes and all opinions are respected of the each individual so guys to let you know everything that we're talking about uh we're talking about pre-2008 you know uh when game foul was legal cockfighting was legal in in the states and then we're also going to maybe be touching on some topics about other countries that's legal which like the philippines for example so that's not really what's going to be the show about but it may be some small bits and pieces that we may refer to but i just want to let you know it's nothing talking about current in the united states so again we're not promoting any illegal activities and all the information is for historical educational and entertainment purposes only so let me go ahead and bring our special guest in we got a huge following already we got almost 100 people watching already and i think that's great within the first uh you know 10 minutes um actually not even 10 minutes the first seven minutes you already got 100 people watching so make sure guys those phones are charged up this is going to be an awesome interview make sure you share it share it share it share it share it because we appreciate it the more people we share is always gives us an opportunity for each one teach one so let's go ahead and bring our special guests in tonight mr jason love for center game far as based out of georgia good evening good evening good evening mr jason how you doing this evening I'm doing pretty good. I uh, just want to say it's an honor and privilege to be invited on the show. Um, so thank you, Jim. And also uh, thank you to o Oki for uh, getting it set up also. Yes, yes, yes. And Oki definitely uh, spoke very highly of you. Uh, he reached out to me and said, hey, listen, you know, I know I see a lot of chatter about Orientals and ACL crosses and all this kind of stuff. I got a really, really great breeder. Um, who's very, very successful in his own right. I really think you should bring him on the show because he'll be able to share a lot of great information to educate the American game fowl breeders here in the state. So um, I'm glad Oki made it possible. Um, and after talking to you the other night, man, it was a great conversation and it was a great recommendation. So Oki, shout out to you, brother, for making it happen. We really, really appreciate it. I know Jason does as well. So uh, Jason, I know you have watched some of the Journey to the Pit interviews, so you got a kind of idea how they go. And typically what I like to do is I always like to start off with a little bit of the history of the breeder for the individuals out there who do not know you. I know you have a large following, but it's still a lot of people that watch the show who do not know you. So let's go ahead and start off with, you know, when did you get in Game Foul? How old were you, you know, and when did you get in Game, game Foul? Um, so basically, I got into game foul probably when I was in the third grade, about nine years old. Um, mm -hmm. My dad, basically, he worked overseas. He worked a lot all over um, Asia. So he worked in okay. the Philippines, Indonesia, Korea. And uh, that was in the late 60s, early 70s. So I, he took a lot of photos. So like I said, when I was about the third grade, he had about, I don't know, 40, 50 photos of nothing but the cockfights in uh, Manila. And right. uh, so I got to looking at those pictures. And, uh, man, I just caught the fever right there. And I asked him to, you know, can we get some chickens, you know? And right. uh, so he took me to the sale uh, down in Jessup, Georgia, a little livestock animal auction that was going on. It's not there anymore, but it was. Right. And uh, he bought me some bannies. And uh, at first, you know, I didn't realize that he bought bannies for me, you know. So <laughs> a little bit later, I figured out, man, Dad, you didn't get me game foul. You got me some bannies, you know. Um, <laughs> So we looked in the Georgia Market Bulletin and uh, found a lady who was selling some game fowl. She was actually getting a divorce and her husband didn't know it, but she was selling his chickens. 
Um, so you know, <laughs> wow. We, we went, yeah, we went over there and I picked up a, a gray rooster from her. And that was kind of my start uh, with the fowl okay. right there, you know. Wow. So that's how you got your start, man. But that's funny. You know, what was your father's response, man, when you told him, hey, these ain't the game fowl that I was looking at those pictures that you had. These some little bannies. <laughs> what was his response? <laughs> OK, OK, let me. go. Yeah. yeah, just like that. OK, OK, man, we'll get you something real. But uh, <laughs> and then, yeah. And then, you know, he saw that uh, I was really passionate about it uh, and I really enjoyed it. Um, so then, you know, he mentioned to me, you know, if you're really going to be passionate about it and have them. I'd like you to do the Orientals. And by that time, I had got a Gamecock uh, subscription. And I kind of had okay. read all the articles by Pat Patterson, Ike Merchant, mm -hmm. you know, The Traveler. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So they really piqued my interest. And, you know, my dad pushed me, you know, go that route if you're going to get into Gamefowl. So that's kind of how it started. And uh, wow. I'd say the, fir the first ASOs I got was uh, from uh, S.D. Whitaker out of Sandersville, Georgia. Um, hey. And he had some uh, he had some sonatows and gons that came from uh, Joe McLevine in South Carolina. Um, so those were the okay. first. Uh, that was my first experience with ASILs or a and Asian gamefowl. And then a little bit later, we would go to Earl Huspeth's up in North Georgia. And I got um, I believe they were sonatows also, but I got one stag. And uh, that was a funny story, man. That guy was hard on his price. You know, we were just little kids, you know, and uh, right. <laughs> he was, my dad's like. Give him a break because uh, my nephew, he loved them, too. You know, he go, he went, we right. both went up there and, uh, man, we haggled over $10. But finally, old Earl, he came off that $10 and we got the stag. But, uh, yeah, and then after that, um, I was in my teenage years. I don't know exactly how old, but we went to right. Shreveport, Louisiana. And okay. uh, we were selling pocketbooks in Shreveport. And so, you know, I knew I'm in Louisiana, man, the, you know, the capital of the world for chickens. Right. Right. And uh, I, so, you know, I knew Ike Merchant lived there. So we stopped by Ike Merchant's house. And uh, okay. that was the first time I guess I ever got to see like real large Oriental fowl. Most of the fowl we were messing with were five, six pounds, you know. Right. And uh, but so I went to Ike's house and um, man, you know, those were like dinosaurs, you know. And um, but I ended up I made some money on that trip. You know, we were helping you know, to go to that trip, but I spent every single dollar I made on that trip right there at Ike. So that money never left Louisiana. <laughs> and, uh, so what did you acquire from Ike when you went out there? Um, at that time, I really don't, you know, they were more, I guess, his North Indians. And then um, I got a pure North Indian cock. I remember him. I called him Pretty Boy. And then I got another stag I ended up calling Wombat. And he was basically a blue Siamese um, okay. North Indian cross. And that's basically what I got from him on that trip. And uh, But, yeah, that was, that was pretty much it. So so what I'm going to ask you, and I guess we could, we, we'll do this either later over the next couple of days, is for you uh, to actually send me some pictures. Because, listen, I hear all these names that you're giving out, but I don't have the slightest idea how some of these birds even look. So yeah. if you can shoot me over some photos, because I would like to post them up so a lot of the guys can get an understanding of exactly, you know, what we're talking about. And there's a lot of guys that's probably already know exactly what you're talking about. But just for my educational reference, I would like to see exactly how all these different birds uh, uh, look. So yeah. when you say that uh, you were um, down there, Ike Merchant, you know, that was the first time you seen the big birds. How big are you talking? How big were they? Um, so we're talking, you know, I, I would, you know, I was really young then. So, but I would assume that they were at least, uh, about seven. And, uh, I think he had some pumpkins there that, um, but they had to have been like large birds, seven to nine pounds, I believe. And wow. um, those pumpkins were really, I really wanted those pumpkins. And he told me, man, all the gold of China couldn't buy one, you know, so I was never <laughs> get, get any of the pumpkins. And um, I believe they ended up, you know, the truth about the pumpkins where they were from uh, Dr. Dave. And um, so when I got home, like I wanted those pumpkins so bad, I ended up calling Kurt Hansen. And okay. uh, he was good. He was good to a kid, man. He loaded up. I don't know how many chickens was in those boxes, but he loaded up several pumpkin uh, hydrobats for me. And um, wow. Pumpkins, you know. Wow. So tell me this, though. So basically, so he kind of like gave you a booster. By by giving yeah, you all those yeah. chickens, huh? Yeah, definitely. You know, his price wasn't expensive, and man, he really—I mean, he put as many as he could fit in that box for me. So I, I always wow. appreciate that. Oh, 
Wow, that's kind of how you got your start. So tell me this. So you said the first experience. Tell tell us about your first experience with those eight seals. And the only reason I I, I want to start off with them because you, as you know, that is becoming a very popular cross with the American game fouls with the eight seals. So tell us a little bit if there is much to tell about your experience with you know with those eight seals when you first acquired them, which I I know you still was a kid at the time though. Yeah. Um, yeah, not much going on. You know, we were just breeding them, you know, like, like you're saying a young kid, but, uh, right. I mean, you know, back then I feel like, uh, there was a lot of real authentic ASOs. I think they were more purebred back then, hard feathered. Okay. Okay. Um, and today, today you could kind of tell that, um, not all, but the majority have been infused with like maybe hatch roundhead Kelso. I'm not sure. And okay. you can just see by, uh, you know, some are having waddles, the eye colors changing, and really the 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 ultimate tell will be the um, feathering. You know, you could definitely tell they're softer feathered, tails a little bit high. You could just look at them and tell they're not, you know, 100% ASIL, you know. Oh, mm, mm, okay. And that's, that's because I was going to ask you, I was going to be my next question to get an idea of how you can kind of tell. So you're saying basically, you know, you said some of them have, and waddles, different eye color, uh, tail placement on them. Um, and, and you said definitely with the feathers is, is signs that you can see that they've been infused with something else, correct? Yeah, correct. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, as long as right. they're getting used properly, you know, it's absolutely nothing right. wrong with it. I do feel right. like uh, today the gene pool for ASOs is uh, very small. You know, um, you could almost, mm -hmm. uh, I'm generalizing, you know, and to my knowledge, but mm -hmm. I'm me most small uh black breasted red aces are either you know the kurt hansen stuff the pakistanis okay. and the other ones would be everything from les melville and um if they're black more than likely it's got rampiri blood which is also from uh kurt and dr dave originally um you know wow you know and then pat had a lot of them not sure where he got you know pat patterson where he got his but ultimately like when you look around it's pretty much uh i think you know people crossed it bred it their own way but uh like mm -hmm. i'm saying the gene pool i don't feel is that big especially today there's a lot of old um orientals or asos that uh really just don't exist today you know so so and, tell and me this because that's my opinion go ahead. Now, you know? no that and that's fine because that's what we ask and that's why we got you on the show because we want your opinion we don't want nobody else <laughs> we, we interview <laughs> you because we want your opinion yeah. <laughs> So, so now that we talk about the A seals, and again, I have very, very limited knowledge about. So, only thing I'm gonna do is just actually repeat stuff that I have heard um, in mm -hmm. regards to the A seals. A name that keep popping up, and you're probably gonna be very familiar with this name, uh, is the Bobby Bowles. Uh, do okay. you know anything about the Bobby Bowles A seals? And if you do, share it with us. Um, you know, I don't know much about it, and that's a touchy subject with uh, ASIL breeders about Bobby Bowles. But I will say, um, probably the best ASIL cock that we're talking about for crossing on American game fowls um, was uh, one from Les Millville that my buddy Cameron out in Oklahoma got. And mm -hmm. um, I'll just say, you know, uh, it was the best one I ever saw. I mean, he could move as good as uh, any Kelso or Roundhead I've ever seen. So, I mean, he was a, a rooster that I'll never forget. Uh, for that type of sport and you know wow. there's two different there's uh different types of asil breeders so you have more of your tape guys who are doing like more of the naked heel mm -hmm. and then you have the guys that are grading them so um i guess to the viewers you know there is a difference you know i i, I would suggest if you're gonna try to go get some i probably wouldn't suggest mm -hmm. the tape type you know you probably want to get the ones just that have been bred for graded like you know, I'm not saying that that was a pure Bobby Bowles or whatever it was, but whatever Les had, I mean, that was a phenomenal rooster. And I could definitely tell that um, you'd be on the right track with something like that if you wanted to make American grades. Wow. Tell us what he kind of looked like. Um, they look pretty, I mean, like a kind of a stocky, short ASIL. Um, mm -hmm. I guess if I'm to critique them, they look pretty authentic. I mean, they look really, really pure. Uh, but you could definitely tell, I believe, just my opinion, that um, they put a little bit of something in them. Um, okay. You know, an ASIL, a uh, natural ASIL is just going to go chest to chest, toe to toe with you. So right. for him to move like a Kelso or a Roundhead, obviously there's had to have been some, uh, you know, some really fine breeding behind that. But definitely some, you know, they've infused something to get him to play like that. Right. So tell me this, Jason, from your opinion, 
Um, did, did, did that breeder have any other birds on his yard, or was he just an Oriental breeder? Uh, my buddy Cameron, um, he basically had a lot of the Roger Mergs from Puerto Rico, um, and he was more of an Oriental guy. Yeah, um, he had okay. he had that he had got the Atkinsons from Les. Okay, and um, and also the Bobby or the Bowles, you know, and then right. during that same time, I was uh, Cameron actually put me on with Les, and uh, I ended up trading some North Indians with Les for a trio of uh, Atkinsons. Um, so mm -hmm. I had the Atkinsons, but I, I never did get the bowls, you know, and at that time I really wasn't interested in getting them, but, you oh. know, looking back, I kind of wish I would have, you know, <laughs> right. Kind of <laughs> wish you did. <laughs> no, that's right. That 2020 high. So like, Whoa, man, I, I missed up that opportunity. I should have yeah. went ahead and grabbed some of those. So, so tell me this then Jason. So that was kind of, uh, and I'm glad you shared that with us too, especially with like you say, how you can kind of identify and look at where we are today with the ACLs from your personal opinion and your perspective. Like you said, it kind of seems like from your knowledge, it seems like it's a very small gene pool that everybody's kind of picking from. Uh, but you can tell that they're being infused. Um, we just made a comment as far as the ACLs are, are pretty much known toe to toe, chest to chest. And the ones that you've seen, he was moving like an American game foul. And, uh, so, you know, he was kind of infused, um, you know, based on, say, Philippines, Indonesian and other states with that chest to chest type of thing. Is that just the standard characteristics for those ACLs? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to compare Orientals, the ACL is probably the gamest uh, foul alive as far as, you know, what we're talking about. If you're talking about tape and naked heels, they are the gamest, but. With the gameness, you know, they're also um, not the smartest, I guess. You know, they're more of a, mm -hmm. they're in your face like Rocky Balboa type of bird. Mm. And then you have your Thai birds who are uh, extremely smart. Um, they can turn, you know, they, and the Thais have bred so many different styles. Um, so, you know, the Aces would be the, I guess, the least smartest um, Oriental out there, you know, but they're the least smartest, but the game is, huh? The game is in, uh, you know, for Philippine type condi uh, competition, they do have value over there because, um, you know, I would say the Philippines is probably the gamest uh, Orientals I've ever seen. I mean, um, they're they're bred extremely game. And I do I believe that's, uh, you know, the ASO influence and probably the Shamo influence they have over there, plus the way they uh, do their birds. Wow. Huh. So you said out of all the Orientals. Now, tell me this, though. The Orientals that you're seeing in the Philippines, do they look like the graded Orientals here? I mean, the, um, I'm sorry, the, the ACLs that you're seeing in the Philippines, do they look like the ACLs that's, that's here in the States? Um, no, I mean, I'm sure there are some, you know, that kind of look like the Bobby Bowles and the Sonatals. For, for sure there are there, but. Um, the ones that I'm describing to you are kind of more like what you would, I guess, call a Kulang, which is your larger size ACL, so probably in the seven, seven to eight pound class, you know, so they're the okay. much bigger ones. Yeah. Okay. So tell me this, Jason, let's, let's just scoot on over real quick to the tie. Cause I'm just catching some of the stuff that you're saying. You said mm -hmm. that the ties you think are some of the smartest, right? Yeah, I mean, if you get, uh, they're they're so smart. They, you know, they know when to get out of there too. You know, so that you know, though, um, they're not the gamest birds, but definitely, um, man, you can't find smarter fowl. Um, you know, the ties have bred, uh, you know, super locks. I mean, they have, I mean, they have uh, chickens over there that wheel. You know, that they run in a circle. Uh, mm -hmm. That's all they do. But then they'll turn around and kick. You know, I don't like that. But man, you know, they've created all these different styles. And I got to give a lot of credit to the Mong brothers in the United States. Um, they're more of a like heterogeneous breeders. They like to mix. Okay. Uh, they're, they're not loyal to any one specific type breed, whether it be Asil, uh, Shamo, you know, Thai. Uh, they mm -hmm. just kind of pick and choose exactly what they like in the traits. And, um, you know, by heterogeneous, they like to mix. Wow. Um, you know, so they're not they're not known for you know breeding lines per se but they're always experimenting and uh they come up with super birds i mean i mean probably the finest uh you know big oriental fowl that you could ever find in the states especially 
Wow. And you said they always in a lab creating something. Yeah, definitely, man. They're always creating. I mean, there's, you know, there's going to be a trend probably every three to five years. It'll be something new that they've come up with. And uh, you kind of you got to keep up with it. You know, you can't um, just take a break, you know. I'm glad I'm glad that you said that, Jason, because that is something that, you know, some other guys has also came on the show and mainly uh, one of the uh, first guest to talk about it was uh, Tonio from from the Philippines. He talked about in the Philippines every four years the quality of the bird changes. So you constantly have to be trying to improve your bird because that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Doesn't work. Like you constantly have to be experimenting with different types of crosses, different selection processes, and stuff like that. He said because the level of the birds every four years is going to increase. Um, he talked about like with the hennies. And the doms, how they were no good, and then four years later, they were just crashing, you know, just smashing stuff. You know what I mean? He yeah, said yeah. it's kind of what what they all had to do. So that's kind of pretty much what you're talking about as well. Those guys out there are constantly trying to stay ahead of the curve. Um, so, Jason, share with us, you know, exactly what breeds, you know, how many breeds or how many bloodlines do you carry currently right now? Um, currently, you know, I breed the Georgia Plucker. Of course, um, I okay. carry the Saab Brazilians and then uh, Bob Rogers Brazilians. And then, okay. um, you know, for my Brazilians, I've also, you know, to keep up with the pace and to keep my blood fresh, you know, I picked up some from uh, uh, John Paul. Okay. Um, I got some of his Pasquale Brazilians to infuse into mine and also got some from uh, a guy, uh, guy, a Vang guy out in California also. So. That's probably the only new stuff I brought in really is just um, some other Brazilians. They, you know, they were either their family or um, they themselves were pretty close to those originally Pasquale Brazilians, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, so that I went to those breeders because they were known for, you know, having those lines. Right. So, so, so Jason, before we move on to the other two, tell us what your Brazilians look like. You know, what's the confirmation? What's the color? You know what I mean? Tell us. Give us an idea what they look like. Your Brazilians, uh, the pluckers, they should be pumpkin. Um, you know, we're talking about not every one of them is like this, but the majority. What I'm breeding for, there should be pumpkin. Um, they should have a black tail. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them have black toenails, but they're basically a pumpkin mm -hmm. breed with a really good structure. And then you know, my saw Brazilians um, are a little bit taller birds. And uh, they were bred for the scale more, you know. So um, I use those to kind of get some height on mine. And the Bob mm -hmm. Rogers, uh, they basically, um, they come pumpkin, blue, and uh, basic black-breasted reds. And um, okay. I use those to grade. I mean, they're not really um, anything fancy. But the mm -hmm. three of those bloodlines combined, I've created kind of my own stuff, which I call uh, GA Brazilians. Okay. And, uh, hey. The reason why I use the pluckers, I guess, because the word plucker and, you know, this may be redundant to a lot of the viewers, but the word plucker is like a bird, uh, typical birds, um, Asian or Oriental fowl, they have to find the head to be able to hit something. On a plucker, mm -hmm. you just can, you basically can, you know, bite on the back, the chest. Uh, you don't need a build hold or the head to hit. You can just basically, you're, it's like a really aggressive style that you just come in there and you just grab anywhere just grab so, so a, he can grab yeah. a tip of a wing he can grab a back you know he's not that plucker basically is a bird that's going to come in and as long as he can get a feather in his mouth he's going to he's going to throw he doesn't yeah, need a particular yeah. placement as far as i need to get the bill hold or get something around the head in order for him to throw if he get a piece of feather in his mouth regardless if it's on his back his wing his tail his bill hold he's going to throw Pretty much. Yeah, that's that's the gist of it. And it's a big advantage, you know, especially if the other bird doesn't. I mean, it's a huge advantage because you're mm -hmm. it's basically they're they're body hitters. Um, so it's a big advantage to have that ability to do it. Um, and then, you know, uh, with my Saab Brazilians, um, mm -hmm. I went uh, I talked to Saab for probably like 10 years. Uh, one thing I want to okay. say in uh, basically chickens um, relationships going to be the key. Um, so you never want to burn any bridges. Uh, you never know mm -hmm. who's going to be what, you know, they may talk to you as a kid and then, you know, 10 years later, you never know. And, right. uh, but that's, that's the key to stay on top, keeping good relationships with people. 
and right. uh, having access. Really, it's about access and relationships, you know. Right. And uh, going back to the sob, uh, so it took me. I'm not exaggerating, man. I think it was like maybe six, seven years. And uh, finally, I got a chance to go out to Texas and visit him. And um, basically, we started at the first pin. Like when you walk in the gate, he has some beautiful pins there. And uh, he had some vipers in there. And we went on in his yard. And then we just started going to his brood pins. And he would pick up right. a Brazil Brazilian or whatever breed it is. And he'd put it in my hands. And he's like, what do you think of this one? And I'd be like, man, it's beautiful, you know? Right. And man, we did that. Like, I don't know how many chickens and how many pins we went down, but he would just hand them to me. And I right. was kept thinking to myself, man, is this going to be the one that he gives me, you know? Because <laughs> he said, you know, he's like, uh, you know, anything you need, Jason, uh, I'm more than willing to share with you, you know? So I was like, okay. Right. And I told him, man, I like to get a pair of the Brazilians, you know? Right. So uh, finally, we got, me and Cam probably got there about, I don't know, it might have been eight in the morning. And I felt like it was like five or six in the afternoon. F finally, he decided which birds he was going to let me get. Um, there was four, there was four pins. And he said, Jason, you could choose any Brazilian cock out of these four pins. So I sat there and looked at him and uh, I picked a real beautiful one. And then for my hen, uh, he had a lot of hens just free ranging. And they were, uh, it's kind of hard to remember, but they were like just sitting on the ground. There were several hens sitting on the ground between a pin and like a building. And he right. just reaches down there and he grabs a hen and he just says, here you go, you know. And uh, so that's how I got my pair of Brazilians. And he told me right after, he's like, you're the only person to ever get to leave or have a pure pair of uh, Brazilians from my yard. And uh, wow. I'll tell you what, that, that little hen, she was a buff colored hen, but man, she was special. A really great brood hen. Yeah, she turned out really super. And that's one he just grabbed from in between the building. Yeah, she was just she was just free ranging, uh, running around, and there was a uh, I don't know five or six hens sitting on the same nest, and he just reached down there and right. grabbed one. And yeah, I'm glad he did because she turned out to be you know throw really excellent birds for me. And um, but yeah, it was a it was an experience, and uh, you know, Sobs definitely um, uh, it's just a God given thing for him, man. I, when you watch a movie, super competitive, and he knows what he's doing. Uh, one mm -hmm. thing that I took from Saab is, um, and he never told me this or anything, but I could definitely tell that and going to your brood pins and setting up your brood pins, he set up his brood pins to take advantage of the rules, you know? So what I say that is his birds were tall and they played mm -hmm. by scale. Mm -hmm. So, you know, back then in the AABA, everything was scale and they they uh, would set the birds up. So he had an advantage in his brood pins and the breed he was breeding uh, because if they weighed, uh, he was always going to have an inch, two inch height advantage to his advantage, you know? So, um, so Jason, I don't mean to interrupt you, but before we get too deep in it, I want you to kind of explain to the viewers what you mean by scale so they can understand what his concept was when it came to the brood pin. You said that he always had advantage at the scale. Okay, so they yeah. had the scale. So you're basically saying his advantage was is he made sure he bred very tall birds, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. They were tall. I mean, if you look at anybody that knows Saab, if you look at his birds, that he breeds them purposely for the height, and uh, and that's and that'd be a huge advantage. And mm -hmm. by scale, I just mean weighing the bird. Like when you weigh the bird, um, if right. he weighs seven pounds and you weigh right. seven pounds, he's already got you by. Um, you know, a couple inches or an inch and a half at least or an inch. Either way, he's going to be taller. So, I mean, right he's then off the rip, off the rip, he's got an 80%, pretty much 80%, 60% advantage on you, you know. Mm, got yeah. you. So you said that is what he's looking for, and that reflects in his brood pins. When you look at his brood pins, you could know exactly what he's breeding for. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, this kind of same way, you know, and in, in – and Orientals, you know, every region or every culture has a different, uh, you know, rules mm -hmm. and the way they do it. And, uh, you know, and we were talking about the Philippines, you know, when I was able to visit there, um, mm -hmm. they do it kind of like what the Mongs do here. It's look and play. It's the old traditional style. Um, okay. You know, in the, pa in the past, you could, uh, uh, you know, even when I first started, you were typically able to hold and feel each other's birds. Okay. As time went on, people just pretty much got away from that. There was rare instances where somebody will let you hold and feel their bird. 
-hmm. but really you have to go by your eye and your knowledge you know and um so you know that that's the old traditional just look and play so right on that aspect you know with the georgia pluckers i'm setting my brood pins up you need a real muscular big thick rooster so if you're going to take okay. advantage of that situation uh if you're the same shoulder height which everybody's gonna you know nobody's gonna want to give an advantage on height or you know right. body but right. i know for sure you know with my georgia pluckers and the types of mixes especially with the bob rogers i'm gonna have at least probably six ounce advantage right from the rip just by looking play <sighs> And so I kind of mm. breed that and I kind of learned that from Saab, you know, like whatever system or rules you're playing and you need to take advantage of it. Um, you know, one of my trips down to Louisiana, I went to Eminem's pit and watched a guy named Mingo win the Derby and mm -hmm. uh, Mingo basically had three foot tall. I mean, I don't know how tall they were, but you're talking about <laughs> they were they were giant, you know, thin birds. And right. I'm sure they're they're not the best birds there, but mingo had bred him that way and it was by scale so he just you know he basically won the derby and uh wow you know, so thinking like that and something for people to think about when they're putting their brood pins together is think about your rules um especially right. on weights mm -hmm. so like um you know if uh let's just say for an example the average weight at a derby with a scale is let's just say 314 to 410. Mm -hmm. all right so to me to take advantage of that, you could bring, you could go on the lower end, the lower fringes mm -hmm. of the weight class and bring three mm -hmm. tens in, or you could go to the extreme and bring about three or four ounces heavier birds and focus on specializing in those areas. That way you're in the derby. It's like, you know, the gauntlet is in between those ranges. Every, every guy out there is breeding, you know, uh, in that weight range. So there at a derby, there might be a hundred birds and 75 of them are all the same weight in that weight range but typically right. what i've noticed is the guys winning they're like either on the higher end or the lower end so in right. the competition is not as hard there you know and not to say that you don't right. want to you know i'm afraid to play the best it's not like that but i mean right. you're protecting yourself your birds right. everything and right so i mean think about those kind of things like um uh you know from you know there's some little grays down here in georgia that are mm -hmm. on the small side uh, I don't know much about the situation, but uh, my estimate would be that they won a lot because they were smaller size, you know? So he wasn't right. going into like these, the major weight classes. He was on either the lower end or the higher end of that derby, you know? Right. So just to make it clear to, so, so the viewers understand that concept, because, you know, we, when, when we talked about that, that made a whole lot of sense because you talked about, you had asked me about, you know, what was the common weights in Puerto Rico and stuff like that. So basically what Jason is saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, back in the day when it's legal, you know, or, you know, Indonesia or the Philippines and stuff like that, you know, a angle that some of these successful competitors use is they breed birds to take advantage of, I would say, uh, not the oddball weights, but the weights that typically bring less competitors, which would be the super big ones or the super small ones, you know. And, and I think that's probably applies no matter anywhere you go. Because if you go to Puerto Rico and you go uh, to the Coliseum, there's not going to be a bunch of birds in it that's 4-2. You know, you might have three or four of them. Uh, but ain't gonna be a whole gang of them near four two. But anything from three five to three twelve is gonna be the whole building is gonna be full of those. So basically, what you're saying is one of the advantages that you can take is looking at you know the 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 weight sizes and seeing what's most common and breed something towards the uncommon, which should increase your advantage to winning the show because you'll have less can people to compete against. Is that correct? Yeah, well, it's like, you know, and like I said, you're not shying away from the competition, but it's like, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes it happens by chance, you know, it's not always on right. purpose that it's gonna happen that way. But like, you basically like for me, like if I was gonna do it, like, like I would specialize in, you know, nine pounds, 10 pound birds, well, how many are out there? And as right. long as I'm breeding for speed and style, um, you know, mm -hmm. there's not gonna be, the competition's not there's just not enough great birds at that weight class but i'm specializing in that that you know of course i'm breeding the best that i could um, right but you know i'm specializing in a certain you know 
like you said, taking advantage of an angle because uh, like we talked about the other day, like, yeah, the guy might have some small ones, but they're not his mm-hmm. thing, but he'll be like, you know what, let's just take them. But then I'm right. sitting here. That's, that's my, that's my specialty right there. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. So Jason, tell me this. We had a question from Donnie. Donnie says, is there, let me put that on the screen. He said, uh, is there ace range? So, you know, if he's asking that question, right. But is there an ace range, you know, um, in, in the foul, I guess he's talking about weight. If I'm, if I'm correct, you know, I would say will be probably most common weight. Uh, you know, the common weight depends on where, where you are. I mean, if you're, if you're out West, you know, it could, I say the probably the hardest class is going to be in your seven to eight pound mm-hmm. in the East. It's going to be eight to nine. Okay. And, um, you know, it just depends on where you are. Um, you know, but yeah, yeah, the ace range is probably going to, I mean, there's the majority of birds are going to be coming eight to nine pounds in the East. And then like okay. I said, in the West, it might be seven to eight. Uh, there's a lot of legendary birds from in the past that, you know, you would think they're big, but they're, when you really check into it, um, like there's this bird named 10 G from white dragon. Uh, it's actually, right. I believe it's on the smaller side, you know, when you look at him, you're like, man, that bird looks like nine pounds, but he's actually not that big of a bird, you know? Wow. And that way, in that weight class, there's a lot of, you know, legendary birds in the, you know, seven pound range. You know? That would probably be the hardest well, okay. over there. You know? That's the hardest. Okay. Tell me now, I'm going to take a few more questions, guys. Uh, so we have another question as well. Um, Jose asks, so what do you think about the Tiger and Brazilians from Mexico? You know anything about those? Uh, I don't have much knowledge on that. I know they're, um, you know, I know a buddy actually in Louisiana that has them. And um, I know everybody, you know, according to what he's telling me, a lot of people want them. And uh, the Tigers are, they got quite a reputation, you know, down in Texas and Louisiana and uh, mm-hmm. Mexico. So, I mean, respect to the Tigers, you know, they really, uh, I mean, it's a highly sought after breed. I don't have much experience in that, but I know that uh, it's a well-respected uh, name in the in that those circles. Okay. And I'll take one other question, which is uh... – Mr. E's asks about uh, if we can tell us a little bit more about Bobby Rogers birds. Is, is it is it any more that you can kind of tell us about Bobby Rogers birds? Yeah, so it, I could talk a little bit about the Bob Rogers and how I met him. So um, same thing. I, I called him probably in 98 or 97. I was still in high school and I uh, asked him, you know, Mr. Rogers, like he ran an ad in the Gamecock for a lot of years. I'm sure several people have seen it and he wrote articles also. And I called him uh, about those years, and he's like, oh, I get 1500 a bird. And I was just in high school, and I was like, man, there's no need to talk to him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, just, I thought that was uh, outrageous prices, you know. And then, you know, late, <laughs> later on, I would call him back. And uh, it took me, like, sob, it took me five or six years of calling him and talking to him and building that rapport with him and uh, mm-hmm. getting that relationship. And finally, he sent me a blue stag. Um, I would say that uh, out of all the Oriental fowl, um, Bob Rogers has the most unique. I mean, they're super hard feather birds. Uh, mm-hmm. They got a very clear eye. <clears throat> they're kind of mm-hmm. at a 45 degree angle. So they're meant to be pushers. Mm-hmm. And um, they really push into a bird and can turn their feet well. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, when I got them, like uh, Bob, he had, he had got cancer at some point mm-hmm. and he had he sold out uh, at one point. And then he got back into birds. So, you know, I ended up getting the second half of whatever he had, but I ended up asking him, you know, if you ever decide to quit, uh, let me know. I'd like to buy them all. And uh, finally he right. called me one day and I believe there was 22 birds that he had left. And uh, I ended up buying them all from him. And, uh, you know, at that point they range from uh, man, some of them are as small as five pounds to, you know, some of them are about low eights. And, okay. um, but I could see the, you know, they're, they're called Bob Rogers, but they're really uh, Pasquale Brazilians. And a lot of guys like played a part in making them really popular. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a gentleman, gentleman named Walter that made them really popular and uh, famous and then several other guys. But anyways, Bob had them and I would say that he kept them as pure as possible. And uh, by the time that I got them, you know, they were a little bit, you know, like I said, the weights were, some of them were really coming small. 
but I could see glimpses of why the Pasquale Brazilians were so famous. I mean, um, that blue stag that Bob first sent me, I mean, mm -hmm. he was a, I mean, an excellent, probably one of the best birds I've ever owned. And, uh, but all wow. I can say about them is, you know, they were unique. I've never seen a bird harder feathered than them as far as Orientals. Mm -hmm. And, um, they had really good structure and, uh, really bit like, uh, when you hold the keel bone, I mean, it was really right. deep. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but their keel was like, I mean, it was big. Some people don't like that, but I like it because when you're just looking play, it's a, uh, you know, they have an advantage because the chest is so deep and big, you know. Mm. And, and explain to some of our viewers, what do you mean by hard feathered? Hard feathered, um, you know, sometimes it could be a little brittle. And this is just, uh, you know, my opinion on it. But the, mm -hmm. the feathers are really uh, hard and they're really close to the body. And it's a lot. It's not as uh, it's not as fluffy. You know, there's no fluff okay. on them. It's just basically, okay. I mean, they're like skin tight. Um, now I will say when they go through the mold, it's really tough on them. You know, I mean, they, you could definitely tell the birds, uh, you know, they go through the mold harder than any, any other line I've seen. Mm. But, you know, Bob <laughs> was, uh, Bob was like, a. I spent a lot of time on the phone with him and, uh, he really helped me out with, uh, the Orientals, man. I, le I learned a lot, probably more than anything from anybody else. I've learned from Bob. I've learned the most knowledge from Bob. So. Um, Most knowledge, right. huh? Yeah. I, I'm going to take a question from Tony. He's one of the guests that came onto the show uh, before he's in the Philippines. He said, what is the best age to fight these naked, uh, naked healers? Log on, well, he just logged in. He just said he just logged in late. Yeah, Tony, we didn't go over that question, so that's why I uh, posed it. But what do you think is that he's located out in the Philippines, um, mm -hmm. and I guess he's just getting into the naked heel so he wants to know, based on your experience, and you have been to the Philippines as well more than one time, you know, what do, what, what do you think is the best age or what should he take in consideration? Um, well, you know, they have different competitions. Uh, definitely in Ternio, you want, I mean, you want probably the, the safest play is going to be two years old. Um, okay. I know in the Philippines, they will play three years old too. So those are going to be really, they're going to be really seasoned birds in that. And then uh, Ternio also has like the stag derby. So, you know, they can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's probably like uh, it's under a year old and probably the youngest, maybe like nine months. And okay. uh, one of my buddies, Lloyd, actually made a, a gauge where you can go over the spur. So um, and they have a, no a lot of knowledge on being able to tell the age of birds, uh, especially right. like Papa Dong. They kind of developed the system on what to look for in the you know, to determine a bird's age, but it has to pass that test. But I would say nine months, even for mine, uh, the, the youngest. And of course you want to, you're not going to go take a nine month old versus a, you know, two year old, but right. you're going to you keep them the same age. But I would say the earliest is, would be nine months, you know, for me. Nine months. Yeah. And they'll run them between nine months and three years old, basically. Yeah, now that's different in this, and uh, it's, it's a little different. It just depends. You know, the Philippine style is a, it's a nonstop contest. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no breaks. Um, uh, I'm more familiar with the tape where there's rounds of 18 minutes and there's 18 minutes of rest. And, uh, you know, um, you kind of treat it, it's just like boxing, man. You have a cut man in the corner, he's taking okay. care of all these things. Okay. Um, and, you know, the birds are getting worked on. And then, uh, and so there's a break, but in the Philippines, you have to have, you have to pace yourself. Uh, Thai birds don't, they'll dominate, but mm -hmm. once they run out of gas, it's goodbye. And then, um, <laughs> yeah. And then, but you gotta be a, you gotta have good structure in the Philippines. You gotta be game. Cause uh, when you get, when, you know, man, it's, it's nonstop. So you gotta have gas and you gotta learn how to pace yourself. So that's why, right. you know, if you're going to do that, everything is by age. You, you wouldn't never, you know, give anybody an advantage on age. So like I'm saying, nine to, you know, nine months, you know, and just make sure you're staying with other nine month old birds or, you know, maybe two months older at the most, but something like that. Right. And like I was telling you, you know, in the, in the tape world, the birds are a lot more athletic and they move a lot. So, you know, their, their uh, prime is going to be, you know, at two years old, after two to three years old, there's very few that will still be in their prime, but pretty much we call it second feather 
Um, one second feathers over and they're going into third feather. Um, they're pretty much retired at that point. Very few can uh, keep on going, you know. Wow. So you said they pretty much retired at that point, huh? Yeah, yeah. So, so tell me this. So now we talked about pretty much the breeds and stuff like that. I know we got some additional questions coming in, but you can answer those, you know, at a later time because we almost at the hour mark. And we ain't even talked about all the other topics we're going to talk right. about. So, guys, I think we went really, really deep on that. And, and that's why I said it's probably going to be a part. This is part one of a two part interview because we probably can spend two hours just talking about that because he has so much information that he can share with us. But let's go ahead and move on now. He talked about his bloodlines and stuff that he carries now. And what we would like to talk about now is kind of move to your selection process so we can get an idea of how you put your brood pins and stuff like that together. So what I would like to do is hear from you, you know, how do you pick your brood cocks? Um, you know, what do you look for in your brood cocks as far as, you know, characteristics, body structure, you know, station, all that type of stuff? Okay. Yeah. So in the brood cock, you know, you're going to ba basically be looking uh, for a uh, a phenotype, you know, stuff that you can actually see. Um, I guess uh, one of the most important things to me, and maybe it may be ridiculous to some, but I like a I like a broodcock that has a big comb. Um, I think it's a sign of vitality, um, mm -hmm. and it's just a lot to it, I believe. But if you look at some of the pictures that I posted, typically my broodcocks have a large comb, and uh, okay. I like to select that. Um, you know, I don't really care about eye color. Um, okay. I'm looking for bone structure. You know, I, I like, uh, I guess some of my reputation is known for having a good bone structure, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and good bone structure, I guess, in American terms, you know, for American fowl would be bottom, you know, you can, uh, you could dish it and you could take it. So that's why you need the yeah. structure. Um, Got you. And, um, so, you know, I, I look at that, um, talking about the phenotypical traits, uh, for me, I do look at the scales a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and I'm just talking about my line. So, you know, right. uh, one of the first things I usually do when I pick up stags that are from my breedings is mm -hmm. I look at the prop toes. Um, and it's always a good sign. And uh, to be honest with you, it's pretty much right on. If they have a split scale on the back toe mm -hmm. on either side, mm -hmm. it's even better if they have a split on both sides. But if they typically have that split, uh, you can almost bet that that stag is going to be of decent quality. Um, I also wow. look down on the side of the leg and, uh, right. I don't like anything that's three rows or more. I like it either two rows straight down or one. Um, hmm. how uh, about, yeah. uh, we got Mr. E's asked about the base of the tail. Uh, the base of the tail. Yeah. That's the super important thing. And, uh, something that I learned from Nasser, um, uh, basically when you run your hand down the back of the rooster, and you grab the base of the tail, like when you, you could wiggle it, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, you want that. I want I like it wide and I like there to be absolutely no space. I mean, you cannot put your fingers between them bones. If they if you can move it around a lot, I just play. I think it plays an important role in uh, power and also okay. balance, you know, and I'm also looking for feather quality. Um, okay. Georgia pluckers are really not known for fe feather quality. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in my opinion, oriental fowl, uh, they go through a lot. And, right. You know, especially if you're going against like underwing styles. I mean, uh, underwing bird could literally tear all your feathers out on both sides. So mm. you need feathers that are pliable, not brittle. You're looking for ones that are pretty flexible and they could bend a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know, a lot of your aces, man, they they won't there won't be a single feather uh, bent at all or broken. You know, very few. And then of course, you know, um, anyways, but yeah, feather quality is really important also. Wow. And so how about station? Like, I know you were saying like the other ones, I think it was Bob Rogers. Something was built at a 45 degree angle. Like how, how about, how about, you know, is it an angle that you're looking for in yours as far as station height, short, medium, tall? Uh, you know, I mean, typically I, I would say the one criticism of uh, maybe some of my birds is I, I have bred more because it's more look and play, right? So mm -hmm. you're not using a scale. So I bred them heavy and thick. Um, but yeah, I, I, right now, um, you know, I'm using the sob a lot more heavily right now lately to okay. get some uh, size, but I don't want to get them too tall because, you know, the Georgia pluckers and some of the bills got a lot of power. So I don't want to, you know, get them too tall and take away anything that, that you know, that, that I, I want to keep in them. But 
Right. Um, you still want to kind of keep that bottom in them. And if you if you breed them too tall, they'll probably start pulling away from that bottom. Yeah, definitely. And um, But, yeah, I am trying to put a little bit of height on them, at least to get them. I like it, you know, medium to high station, but not, not super tall or anything like that. I'm right. not trying to, you know, get my birds to look like shamos that are really upright and tall. Right. I, I do like that, you know, 45 degree angle, you know, so they can go go into them, you know, uh, push really well. Right. So, so, so Jason, tell us, so what do you look for in your hens? Um, hens, I learned a lot from Nasser. I mean, obviously, you know, the style is what you can see and what we're all breeding for. Um, so the hen has to be the same, you know, I, I don't, a lot of guys say, well, I, I never look at my hens, but mm -hmm. you look at your stags. Why would you treat the hens any differently? If you're trying to, you know, get a homogeneous thing going on the style um, right you got to check the hens you can't just like oh they're they're off this bird and that bird and therefore they're good so to me you're trying to take those homogeneous traits and uh you know you know nothing's 100 percent foolproof but you're trying to right. eliminate you know a lot of stuff and so to me if you use uh even my buddy star you know we talk about hens and um you know, you want to use that dominant hen. I like the dominant hen. I don't want to get too dominant, though, because, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like if you do that for a long time, you pick the real dominant hens with the long spurs and they're like really manly, then I, I think that might lead to, you know, production problems down the road, you know, but mm. I do like a, a dominant hen. I also like my hens that have big combs also. Some of my better brood hens I do select right. because they have a large comb. And, but you gotta, you gotta take a look at them because, you know, it's, it's all about the way the birds play. So, um, you gotta right. make sure that they're, they're, you know, I have the same standard for my hens as I do for my uh, roosters kind of, you know, that's the best way to look at it, in my opinion. So, so tell me, Jason, like, as far as a mental attitude, you know, are the, are the hens all skittish or, you know what I mean? Are they flying all around a pen when you stick your hand in there? Like what, what is type of their temperament? No, you know, the only Oriental that's wild like that is probably your um, Atkinson's from Les. Those things are wild. But I would say my breeds and other Orientals are super gentle, especially if you spend time with them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you could you could kind of do like that with your fingers and they'll, they'll mm -hmm. come up to you. And, you know, the hens, I mean, it depends on how much time you're putting in your birds, too. If you never touch them, of course, they're going to be real skittish. But right. if you're handling them a lot, you know, they're, they're all like pets, man. Uh, I know some people, you know. They'll say, oh, man, that ace is like a pet, man, like a dog, you know, follow me all around the yard. So that's pretty much their demeanor. You know, they're pretty mm. gentle. I, I honestly, uh, I haven't had any any of them that are I had a Pama Brazil one time that, man, he he'd get you, man. He would take every opportunity. If he could hit you, he'd try, you know, but, <laughs> but that's about the only bird that I ever owned that was like that. You know? Right. So, so tell me, tell me this. So now, now guys, we got an idea of what he looks like, what he's looking for in his brood cocks and what he's looking for in his brood hens. Um, let's move on to, you know, as far as setting your, your brood pins up. Uh, do you use natural hatch or do you use an incubator? Um, well, I did both. So I went to the Philippines in uh, 2019 and 2020. And uh, mm -hmm. if, if any of you guys ever get a chance to go, you got to go. Uh, so mm -hmm. it, to me, it was a life changing experience. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the hospitality is awesome. And uh, so anyways, you go over there and you get the fever, man. You come back, you go see these. I went to Martin and Marlon Escalin's farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just talking about they have the most beautiful facilities I've ever seen. I couldn't imagine the right. amount of money you'd have to put uh, to have something like that over here. But. But, you know, Martin taught me a lot about the incubator um, and uh, basically looking at this facility. So, you know, I had the hype. I came back here. I went to Dickie's in Millen, Georgia and got me an incubator, a cabinet incubator and went crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, um, So I hatch a lot. But for me, um, I really don't uh, I prefer to hen hatch, you know, but I, I did raise quite a few with the incubator. But I felt like and those numbers, like especially with Orientals, like you know when the hens hatch them i don't i really don't like uh 12 babies in a batch uh my best batches are probably like four to six babies and those babies typically there's not much competition for the food and right. uh, they get to eat but when you're raising on an incubator it seems like no matter how much food you put out there they just didn't grow as uh big right. as like i, I would have liked them mm -hmm. um 
and you know talking about incubator uh, i do use uh battery cages uh, for the okay. hens is something that i saw and basically a battery cage meaning uh you just basically put the hen in there and it's kind of built at an angle and the egg rolls mm -hmm. out and anyways but with the big oriental hens um there's a lot of them that i have to eat eggs or break eggs so i right. kind of got i i still use the incubator like it's an important brood hen i will incubate right. her eggs and then i'll use mm -hmm. her in a battery cage and um so this past year um i forgot who told me about or who gave me the idea but i started buying uh for the egg eating hens mm -hmm. i started buying like you just go when the eggs are on sale and i, I bought like probably for this hen i probably bought six dozen eggs and i probably put okay. four dozen dozen all over the floor and i mean she was a type of hen the egg was still hot man it barely it hadn't even been on the ground for like two seconds and she'd be turned she'd turn around and eat it and i used blinders <laughs> and all kinds of things but nothing really worked, right. you know and some people would say cut the beak off she won't eat but man you cut the beak off and they'll still try and they'll get it eventually you know it might work for right. a day when it's real tender but after that man, right get it but what really worked well was i just put like four dozen eggs all over the floor and you know watched her go to town and she, if she ate that i'd put another dozen every morning before i went to work just keep piling them in there and i of course i put the nest bucket off the ground mm -hmm. and uh and let her eat as many as you want and man she went in the nest bucket laid her eggs and hatched all the babies and uh but I, and i've done that to about four different hens now and i, I don't care how bad of an egg eater it's worked uh I actually borrowed a hen from my buddy that he said there's no way you can hatch natural with her and uh i end up getting a batch out of her using that method i know it's a little crazy but it works man you know they'll, they'll it works so 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 guys listen man that's the first time i ever heard this so so what jason does for uh uh and we have had many people on the show that talk about different types of things you know the styrofoam you know golf balls you know all different types of methods for the um you know, for the egg eating, uh, egg eating hens. So you're basically saying that, you know, what you have seen with all the things that you have tried is go to the grocery store, buy some eggs on sale and put a bunch of those eggs from the store, store brought eggs inside of the pen on the ground. Um, obviously yeah. you said you lift the, the nest, uh, uh, the nest bucket up off the ground. So you fill the bottom of that pen with a whole bunch of eggs from the grocery store. And just let yeah, her eat, 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 eat. She yeah, eat them she all up. Eat. You come out there and you put another dozen out there. Yeah, and then you say over going. time, what ends up happening? Over time, she quits eating the eggs and then she lays her eggs and doesn't mess with them. And I guess if she does get a kick on eating anything, she'll just eat one that's out there on the ground, especially with the nest off the ground. She's not going to, you know, get in there easy. And, right. uh, you know, with the Oriental hens, they're large, so they break eggs. Uh, I hear a lot of people, oh, it's mineral deficiency. But really, honestly, like, let's just be honest, man. When they finally discover there's a, an egg can be eaten, they just, they love right. it at that point, you know. Um, so that that's my opinion, and that's a way that you could break it. Now, I do put the ceramic eggs. I put about two ceramic eggs in her nest bucket, and that'll get her started, you know. You know, mm. I, I do that also. So you just use a combo. You put the ceramic eggs in the in the nest bucket, and then you also do the grocery store eggs on on in the in, on the floor inside the pen. Yeah. Now, if, and if I had laying chickens or something like that, I mean, I have Oriental chickens, so you know they're not laying a ton of eggs. You know, if, if right. I I could, you just use my own eggs, but you know they don't really lay enough to do something like that. So. Right. Right wow guys that's right there that's the first i ever heard of that technique and you said you did it with about four hens and one of the hens the guy said there's no way you can natural hatch her and you got a you got a you got a clutch out of her huh yeah i did yeah yeah so i mean it really works i mean and it's not that you know difficult i mean it's kind of weird or you know out of the uh, out of the box but it works right you know it's definitely if you got a hard hen, uh, re really important brood hen that you need something out of, I, I would try that method, and uh, I'm sure it'll work for you like it worked for me. Right, right. So so now we know that you're doing the uh, natural hatch. Um, tell me, you know, as far as your feeding program, you know, as far as for the chicks, what are in there with the mom? So, you know, what is your feeding program? What you kind of start them off with? Um and I also will talk about some other stuff too, but you know, let's just start yeah. with the feed first. Um, so on one of my trips out to Louisiana, um, I hung out with a buddy named Chad and uh, I, I learned about uh, Perina Show Chow 
Um, mm-hmm. So they did continued it out here, but man, that was the that's the highest quality chick starter or grower I've ever seen. And uh, so basically, I, when mm-hmm. I came back, I was using that. The closest thing that you can get to it now is basically that Tractor Supply Organic uh, comes in an orange bag. Um, so okay. I, I mean, I try to I try to feed them, you know, the best quality feed. And what I like about it is when you uh, mix it with water. Um, it's just not like any other chick starter that I've used when you mix it wet it, uh, and they, they gobble it up, you know? So, and, right. uh, my birds have done really well and been healthy. And, you know, if I can't get that, uh, the organic one, cause it is pricey, man. I mean, we're talking about $30 a bag pretty much. And wow. or you can use the, uh, flock razor by Perina. That's, that's my choice. You know, I like to use that on the biddies. Um, it's gotcha. something that I picked up from, uh, Mr. Merchant, um, that I do. And, uh, as I, I use some uh, clovite conditioning powder and okay. then I buy some, like, the smallest parakeet uh, seed that you can buy, you know, for just uh, little parakeets mm-hmm. and parrots, uh, real fine little small seeds. Right. And then um, get them little tall, get them, yeah, tiny seeds. Yeah. Yeah. And then wheat germ oil. And I kind of mix that all up. Uh, it's not a five gallon bucket. I probably got like a three gallon bucket. So, you know, we're talking about right. halfway filled up. So somebody could get the idea, put maybe uh, three or four tablespoons of that clovite conditioning powder. They mm-hmm. actually have a little plastic scoop in there. So maybe three or four of those. And then mm-hmm. also one thing he taught me about, uh, you know, for Orientals, the bones are really important. Uh, and okay. also I like structure. So um, you just get some oyster shell and use a mortar and pestle and you kind of just grind it up as, as fine as you can. And uh, mm-hmm. basically it's just a good way uh, to introduce the grains to your chicks at a young age. And right. uh, I think that extra supplement of calcium and all the vitamins and mineral, I mean, it can't hurt, you know, it's only going to just make them healthier and, uh, you know, it'll pay off in the end, definitely, if you can uh, do that um, all the time, you know, as much as you can. Right. So tell me this. So we have a question from Donnie. Donnie said, what per, what protein percentage is that um, is that starter? Um, I believe it's, uh, don't quote me, but I, I want to say it's like 16 to 18 uh, percent. It's nothing okay. extremely high. I mean, I have used game bird starter, which is like 20 percent. Okay. Um, but you know, on the Orientals, like, uh, maybe for American fowl, that's okay. But the Orientals, you kind of want a little bit lower protein, uh, because mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're going to grow and you don't want them to grow too fast. Uh, right. Um, cause they're already big you, meaty birds anyway. So you yeah, load them with the protein, probably and, accelerate uh, it. They accelerate it. And then, uh, they'll have, uh, probably, you know, not all the time, but I have seen it where it'll cause some like knee joint problems where they're, you could just tell they don't, they're not walking right or, you know, uh, they just don't do well on a real super high. Now I, I do also feed uh wet dog food too. Um, Oh, you I do, huh? Food. Yeah. I like the wet dog food. I will pump them up. I guess that's my protein right there. Right. Um, but they, you know, anything wet, uh, just once a day, whether it's chick starter or the dog food, I kind of alternate it. Right. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the extra protein is good too. You know, I just try not to keep it, uh, really high for the Orientals, you know, but I, I do give them a gotcha. little bit, you know, not much. I'm not putting like a baseball full of dog food, but I'm putting the, you know, like a golf ball or less per bird, you know. Got you. Got you. So tell me this, do you vaccinate? Um, uh, the key, uh, for, you know, to me, the most important vaccination is going to be pox, um, mm-hmm. uh, and the oriental birds. I mean, it depends if they get a light case, they'll be fine, but I've had it where mm-hmm. they get the wet pox and the dry pox at the same time. And, uh, they're just mm-hmm. never the same. So to me, it's only what, 10, 15 bucks for the pox vaccine. And, uh, it can right. basically save your, save your year, you know, and, uh, it's definitely worth it. I mean, it's something cheap and preventable. Other than that, I, I don't vaccinate. Um, my idea is that, and I don't have a big farm. So mm-hmm. I think the most birds I've ever had was maybe about 400. Um, okay. Currently, currently I'm probably about 80 and that's uh, young okay. birds and everything. Okay. So I don't have a big farm. So I don't find it necessary really to have a, you know, vaccine. And then I know if you're running a big operation, that's something different. It's quite a huge investment uh, to have right. and something to go wrong. Right. For me, I also feel like, you know, once I do introduce the vaccine, of course, I'm going to have to continue to do that. So if I don't have to, I I try not to, you know. Right. And and from your experience, you really haven't had too much of a problem with it, huh? No, I I don't. I haven't had any issues with, uh, you know, knock on wood, but Mm -hmm. I haven't had really uh, 
any major disease. I mean, I, I don't really let a, um, I don't have a lot of new birds coming in. That's kind of a, right. almost a cl closed flock. I mean, I do bring in a couple birds every year, but um, for the most part, they stay pretty healthy. And I haven't had any issues with anything I should vaccinate against. So tell me this. Uh, do you, you know, it's also on the chicks. So we talked about the feed, the vaccination and stuff. Do you run any vitamins or anything in any water or anything like that? Any antibiotics or anything or just straight water, you know, with your, with your starter uh, feed and stuff like that? Is, or is there any additional stuff that you do? Uh, nothing additional as far as when I mix the water with the chick starter. Only that mixture which I don't feed that wet. Now the, the mixture I was talking about, the clovite conditioning powder, I just right. feed that in their dry feed uh, with the wheat Got germ oil. Um, as far as my water, um, I'm not going to say I'm consistent on doing any particular thing with the water. The only thing okay. I really do with the water is um, with big orientals. Um, canker can be a problem. Um, mm -hmm. I always like to go through all my fowl and look in their throat and check in for any yellow spots. Um, I've had canker. I had some pretty bad issues with canker in the past so mm -hmm. for the canker i will run some stuff in the water and basically what i used um i basically buy a bag of the man i'm drawing a blank on what it's called but it's the blue powder copper copper sulfate so okay in a, in a gallon jug i'll buy a the i think it's 16 ounces in the bag of that copper sulfate and i'll dump mm -hmm. the whole thing in that gallon of water and i think i put about 10 ounces of um i like i heard other guys say that no difference in organic um apple cider vinegar or you know you know the regular pasteurized one but mm -hmm. I, I used the uh organic one brags from walmart right so i mixed the blue copper sulfate and the um brags uh you know apple cider vinegar together and i mix that up in a jug and basically i'll take a tablespoon of that and put in each chicken's water and basically that I, to me i've seen like um with game fowl like mm -hmm or with orientals or in my dealings with, I could be wrong, but in my dealings with canker, it's something almost impossible to actually get rid of a hundred percent. But wow. that, copper, oh. that copper sulfate um, will really knock it down to where it's not affecting the bird. And you could check it and that, you know, that you won't see anything, but you, you got to stay on top of it to me. Like once right. I see it come, if you don't stay on top of it, you know, it could come back. You know, it's not like uh, I hear pigeons, you know, you can actually cure it. But chickens and I may be wrong on that. But mm -hmm. to the best of my knowledge, uh, um, I haven't seen anybody or myself really right. seen anybody cure uh, canker, you know, 100 percent. Got you. But, so so that that kind of gives us a rundown. So like you say, you don't breed a whole lot of birds, but you know, you kind of make it very simple. You got your, your technique and your strategy, well, your program put together. Tell me, um, you have, you, you, one thing I'm noticing also too, is your understanding that the Orientals are a different bird than the American game fowl and, and, and require different things. Like you say, as far as protein, you may not want to go as high on orientals so i guess you found out over time that there is a difference between raising breeding and caring for them orientals versus raising breeding and caring for the american game fowl is that correct yeah i mean it's correct uh I, I don't if you had there's no way that you know some of the numbers that some of the bigger breeders raise uh there's mm -hmm. no way you could raise orientals in that mass quantity like that mm -hmm. I mean, you could breed a lot of them, but, uh, you know, just the hens, uh, you know, they're not laying, you know, they're just not as productive with the eggs every year. Right. So that, that, that's a major difference on the Orientals and, you know, the demeanor, of course. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a lot. Uh, the pin design is different. Um, you know, you wouldn't use fly pins for, I'm talking about bigger Orientals, you know, right. if you're having six pound aces, even then, you know, I might consider dropping the roost pole down. None of my roost poles are over two foot high. Typically, they're, you know, some of the roosters could probably, they can't walk under. They have to look, drop their head down a little bit. But, mm. you know, that's just for the purpose of, you know, they're big, you know, eight, right. nine pound birds. So you, you can't have them hopping down from a, you know, a really high roost pole uh, and hit, and the impact on the ground will affect their knees, you know. Got um, you. So, so when you do have them, so, and that was going to be the next question that we were going to kind of get to as well. You know, like as far as your stags, you know, your yard setup, do you use pins, tie cords, barrels? 
Uh, no tie cords or barrels. Um, my, I do have some round cages, you know, for like mostly I, I try to put hens and stuff in the round cages. And I do have some of the Mexican cages that are, okay. um, you know, I think 39 by 39. But typically that's just going to be for a single pull. It's uh, my stags. I like to have them in at least a four by eight. Um, okay. I have a I have a few pins as big as um, uh, eight by 16. I mean, if I had it my way, they'd have plenty of room like that. Um, I just feel like Orientals need the room uh, to move right. around. You know, they're not going to develop properly in a 39 by 39 square. It's just not going to happen. Got you. And so so those are one of the things. So just even raising Orientals, if you raise a lot of them, you're going to need a lot more space because the pins and stuff going to have to be a lot bigger than it would normally be for the American game foul because of their body structure, the way they grow, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, you talked about the, the roost. You know, you said you don't like to keep it over two feet high just due to the fact of the size of the Orientals and them jumping from a high area, you know, you said can start affect their joints and stuff. Is there any particular uh, bedding that you use in your pins that, that works great for the Orientals? Well, bedding, uh, you know, I, I, sometimes I use hay, you know, I try and uh, I do like to use hay or I just rake up. I got, you know, Georgia's like the pine straw capital of the world or pine tree capital <laughs> of the world. So, you know, you can you can just go out in the yard and rake up plenty of pine straw. But I like right. to put that in there. Um, you know, pine straw. I don't know if you want to get into this topic, but uh, putting other stuff in my pens from a farm or somewhere. And I'm not saying that it comes from that, but I'm worried about bugs. You know, um, one issue that I think is really important to a newbie would be uh, talking about red mites. Um, I didn't really just dis- I didn't I didn't really you know, I, I was like. Uh, you know, there's difference. There's northern mites would get on, which get on their vent, and then okay. you have the red mites that are living inside the cracks of your roost poles and inside the cracks of your pins. So, mm-hmm. um, I try now. I try to get away from uh, the red mites are my concern. Um, okay, I had a really special uh, rooster, and uh, I know some of the guys that know what we talk about. But right in the front of the knee, they'll get a sore right there, mm-hmm. and then you'll just think it's a scratch or something. Uh, but what happens is, is the red mites come out and they go up the legs, you know, you can only see them at night. So if you're a new uh, beginner in the sport uh, and you had your pins for any, it doesn't matter how long you brand new or not, you just should go check your foul at nighttime, look on the roost poles, just mm-hmm. get them to stand up a little bit and look, have a light and look at their legs. And if you see any little dots, and especially if you look under the roost pole, sometimes when you have an infestation, man, they will be thousands of them underneath your roost pole and of course wow. that's not gonna that's not gonna breed healthy chickens i mean you got mites in your in your pens right and, uh you know they're, they're sucking their blood at nighttime so you need to get rid of that and uh but basically what happens is they go up that knee and i learned that from doc edwin and the philippines <laughs> that the mites basically go up there to that tender spot in the knee and they feed right there and then when they leave they basically after the bite they leave a fungus behind so I don't know if the American mm. fowl breeders um, have done that, but I see a lot in the Oriental community or Oriental bird community. And uh, you think like, oh, just some Neosporin will help it, but it won't do anything. And the soil will just gradually grow slow. And it'll, it'll eventually, you know, eventually turn into an infection if you can't figure it out. And uh, basically the bird will more than likely, you know, pass away from that infection. I mean, it takes time now, but right. if you see any scabs on the front of your kneecaps, you got a red mite problem. And, uh, you got you know, my, yeah. And, you know, I, I do use diamaceous earth in the dirt for that. Uh, supposedly mm-hmm. diamaceous earth is like glass. So when the mite crawls through the diamaceous earth, it's basically, you know, shredding his body. Um, mm. so I do like to put that in my bedding. Um, and then also, you know, something I learned from the pigeon guys, you just take a paintbrush and, uh, paint all your crevices and your pins, uh, with that diamaceous earth. And, uh, but believe me, when they get in that wood, they're deep right. down in that wood. You could, you know, guys say, oh, just put motor oil on it or put gas. Man, I promise right. you that <laughs> you could put that motor oil on and come back out there in a week and they'll be there. They get so far down in that wood. It's almost to me, it's like uh, I kind of got away from uh, wooden roost poles. And uh, usually you make like a T out of a two by four. And that's what we right. use for the Orientals. But I kind of went to PVC, um, you know, and even some of the fiberglass stuff that you could buy just so they can't burrow down in the cracks. Mm-hmm. You know? But it's something that I ever since I had that problem, I mean, I took him to a vet. I was willing to spend, you know, you know, four or five hundred dollars. And 
I told the guy about the mites and he's like, I promise you it's not about mites. And, uh, it was really no help at all. And I, I, I called my buddy, uh, Edwin in the Philippines that, um, he's got a lot of experience with that. And he told me exactly what it was. And, uh, ever since then it hasn't been a problem, you know? So if anybody gets that scab on the front of the knee, that's, that's what it's from. That's what it's from. So, so tell me this, Jason, let's just back up. Well, I ain't gonna say back up, but, but kind of the, the I want to talk a little bit about culling. You know, we talked mm -hmm. about, you know, the breed and the brew pins, the bitty care, you know, that kind of stuff. And now we're talking about pins and stuff, but let's talk about, you know, culling, you know, at least on the chick side, is there any particular, like, you know, if you do get chicks that start to get a little sick, do you just automatically cull them or, you know, do you try to give them a little, not saying you run a hospital, but do you try to give them a little, nurse them back a little bit, or you just call any type of, you know, just let nature take its course. If, if the chicks are weak, um... Well, you know, to be honest with you, I kind of let it, uh, um, nature take its course. I mean, it depends on how important it is, but at the same time, you know, I want my chickens to have a good constitution also. Um, mm -hmm. so to me, like, you know, I kind of let nature run its course, uh, for the most part. I mean, I do help them out a little bit, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, it just depends like Carizer or something like that. I mean, you could, you could get that pretty easy. Um, you know, I, I use some of the Filipino stuff. Uh, that's the stuff that actually works in my opinion. Right. And some right. of the Thai meds. So it, that's a little bit minor, you know, so I will uh, give those meds to them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. For the most part, uh, culling, the only thing, if it's really sick uh, to me, if like he's wheezing a lot with the air uh, to me, right. it's really not worth uh keep on going with that because I, uh, uh, to me, it's going to have damage and you, endurance is super important in Orientals. And if they've had a breathing problem in their life, mm -hmm. um, you could almost bet they're not going to be, you know, uh, they wouldn't be like brood material or even usable. You know? Right. So, so, so now let's talk about maybe, you know, let's move just fast forward just a little bit. Besides sicknesses, you know, uh, what are some of the reasons that you would call some of your stags? Um, I, I let them all grow up and I give them all a fair chance. Um, I wouldn't say that I even call anything, honestly. Um, okay. I would, I just basically, um, you know, give them away to somebody mm -hmm. in the area that doesn't do anything, you know, that, uh, I, there's a lady around here that I just give anything that any, uh, physical trait that I don't like, um, mm -hmm. uh, crooked breast bones, you know, but that's not, I mean, it's something that you don't want to have happen, but at the same right. time, that could be a roost pole issue. Um, right. With big, big Orientals, it's uh, not smart to use a round roost pole at a very young age because that will be the that will be the cause of the crooked breast, not from a genetic, uh, you know, anything genetic. It mm -hmm. just could be your roost poles. But, um, but yeah, if you have an issue like that, like I was telling you about the tail, if it's a little bit wobbly um any any issues with the knees or joints mm -hmm. you know like they don't mm -hmm. walk around right right um or just any deformity that you know could pop up um yeah yeah you would call for those reasons you know right okay so let's talk a little bit about now because we talked about the pins and the setups that you have you know what what is your all-around feed you know do you do you feed the same feed all year or do you switch up feed? What do you feed your yard? What's your yard feed? Uh, my yard feed, uh, I use Showtime. Um, so that's made right here in Georgia. So I'm, I use Showtime. Mm -hmm. I will say one thing if you're, I don't know about American fowl or smaller fowl, but every year I don't like to use the conditioner by made by Showtime because it has the P in it. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, it, it's killed it's it'll kill big orientals like they'll just choke on that pea um mm. and that's my experience with it so i try to stay away from any feed with pea so i do like the showtime maintenance okay um but basically i'm using a um a real high quality the best quality at least uh gamecock mix that i can and then you know during uh brood season or breeding season i will give a little bit of the dog food and some of the wet feed to my adults also um, okay but other than that, I really don't have, uh, I don't really change up the feed. I feel like, uh, you know, no matter what I'm doing with the birds or what time of the year it is, um, I pretty much keep it the same other than like, right. you know, in the winter months, any month I breed in any month that starts with, that has an R in it. Um, so I could breed as early as September hmm. and 
you know, so as long as it has an R, I feel like it's okay to breed. So, you know, in that, in those months, if I'm breeding, then, you know, I will do a little, boost a little bit of the protein up with the, you know, the wet dog food or wet chick starter with my adults, with a high quality uh, game oh. fowl mix. Okay. And I can tell you, I did a tour of the Showtime uh, factory. Um, mm. So they, they, that feed is a really, really good feed. I spent the whole day there with the owner of the factory. It was nice. We went to lunch, but that factory and that feed, man, that's a really, really good feed. And I, I, I went there because in Puerto Rico, that's the feed that I feed is Showtime. Yeah, yeah. Um, you just said something that sparked my interest. Why do, did somebody teach you or how did you come up with this concept of breeding you know, months with R's in them. Where did you get that from? Um, well, you know, any month that doesn't with Orientals, you know, the perspective is that if you're raising late summer birds, they're going to be small. Uh, it's just the way it is. I think they consume more water during the summer months. So they're gonna, you know, maybe their genetics are nine pounds, but because you bred in, um, you know, July and August, they only reach like seven and a half or something. Mm. Um, and then, so any month with an R is like, you know, the weather's good. I mean, uh, to me, you know, the best chicks I raise are typically like at December hatched. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, it's cold, they eat a lot of feed and they don't, they're not drinking as much water. Uh, that's my mm -hmm. opinion on it. And so that's why I breed in the months of R. And then of course, naturally spring is in the months with the R. So that's the time when, uh, you know, nature is pretty much doing their thing. So. Right, I'm trying to keep it like nature, and it's honestly something that I learned from a, a Puerto Rican breeder that I was talking to. Okay, um, from one of the old forums is uh, who I learned that from. Wow, so hmm, that's that. I think that's some great information, and it makes a lot of sense as well. Because, like you say, in a hotter month, they will consume more more water, which will then turn into them consuming less feed. So you're right; they're getting less less nutrients less food in their system because they're consuming a lot of water because of the time of the year and the temperature outside so um let's talk about <clears throat> you know as far as worming and stuff like that with the orientals you know do you put them on a worming regimen or do you worm at all you know do you worm every six months what is your concept or what what's your uh program as far as worming uh, worming, I like uh, the LDI wormer from the Philippines, um, mm -hmm. and basically I just try to do it like every 30 days. Um, okay. Uh, when I worm, I also, you know, use like Adam's flea and tick spray, uh, you mm -hmm. know, shot under each wing and on the vent and maybe under the neck. So that's pretty much my, you know, parasite program right there. Just try to be real consistent every 30 days. Right. And, uh, you know, just don't try not to skip anything. Uh, just try to be as consistent as possible with uh, doing that. And you'll keep your birds pretty much parasite free along right. with that diamaceous earth and just keeping an eye on those, you know, make sure you don't have any red mites that, red mites. you know, are hurting them at night when they're sleeping. You know? Right. So because we covered a lot. So let me so let's talk about this. What are some of like, say, some of the common diseases? You know, what are what are some of the common diseases with the Orientals or things that they struggle with? Um, certain breeds, uh, well, I mean, honestly, I think your biggest battle is going to be like the canker and the coryza. Um, those are the two okay. orientals are pretty susceptible to that coryza. Um, but for the most part, I mean, and, and that's not, it's not that common, you know, as far as the coryza, it'll happen to one or two a year mm -hmm. or maybe a little more, but it's not, you know, it's not like where I'm dealing with it, fighting it, you know. For the most part, man, uh, the Orientals are really hardy. They're tough. Uh, they stay healthy. I mean, some of them never get sick in a day of their life. And I would say that's the majority. It's not an exception. Uh, Orientals right. are typically pretty hardy. Um, there are certain strains that may have a little bit of Merrick's in it, but, um, I, you know, I really don't, I don't fool with anything that, uh, you know, has Merrick's, you know. Um, right at all yeah no that's exactly right so you know it, this has been great information man and we have had a lot of uh comments in, in, in regards to you know the educational aspect as far as the history you know different bloodlines and stuff like that you really open up a lot of guys eyes and they had a lot of questions we would not get into all of them questions because like i said we spent the first 50 minutes it seemed like talking about bloodlines um <clears throat> so I think, you know, we pretty much cover most of the topics. Uh, you know, we talked about your brood stock. 
you know, your selection process, your brood hens, your brood cocks, your brood pins. Uh, we talked about, you know, incubating natural hatch, you know, your feed for the chicks. Um, you know, if you, what type of yard setup that you have, you know, you don't put your, so you said your stags, when you said those uh, Mexican pins, them 39 by 39 by 39s, do, are those the one, the pins that you typically put your stags in when they start acting up on a yard? No, uh, to me, like a stag, um, honestly, I mean, it, it does happen, you know, like there, I do have to use them for stags sometimes, but if I had it my way, they would never see a day in anything that small. It's just not, you know, Oriental needs to develop a lot. Um, so right. I feel like the bigger pins that you can uh, afford for or your Oriental fowl, uh, and I'm talking about the big ones, seven pounds and up. Like to me, you need at least a four by eight, and that's pretty four much by standard. If, yeah, if you look in the Asian community, I mean, pretty much a standard size pin for each stag is going to be a four by eight coop. Um, you know, sometimes they use the the wire cages that are kind of like. Mm -hmm. uh, you know thailand style folded on the top but not not right. most guys don't and i definitely don't I, i'm trying to keep it at minimum uh four by eight pin uh is what i like got you, know? you. if i had it my way you know uh eight by 16 is better you know eight by 16 right 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 um but yeah man i i think jason like i say it's uh it's been you know i'm looking at some topics because i've written some stuff down here but i think we kind of covered we've been on on over an hour and a half which you know i don't think you surprised because we end up talking probably about that long the other night so what are some of the things uh what would you suggest you know as far as you know it's going to be a lot of guys after this interview that you have sparked their interest you have you know filled in some blanks of some things that maybe they was thinking about you know what would you suggest for anybody that's kind of looking to get to acquire some, you know, just a few Orientals, just to kind of, you know, stick their feet in just a little bit. What what would you suggest to them if they wanted to go out there and kind of go down that path? Um, you know, it's all about, like I said in the beginning, it's all about relationships. So, you know, mm -hmm. you know, do your research, of course. Um, mm -hmm. find out, you know, you know, to me it's all about uh passion. Like uh that's one thing I forgot to mention, but like, you know, I had all these breeds. I've had uh I mean pretty much almost if, if you were selling ASOLs and I was a kid, I tried to buy them from, you know, so I tried to, I tried <laughs> everything, you know, and, um, and then, you know, I finally got the Georgia pluckers. I really got the Bob Rogers first. Uh, then I got the, I got my broodcock Gargola, um, a Georgia okay. Plucker broodcock. And then I got the sob, you know, and, uh, those foul, like, you know, I don't know, you get that warm fuzzy feeling inside and you're really passionate about those breeds. And, right. uh, that's what you got to have. Like, and uh, so what I'm saying to a beginner that wants to get into it, like, mm -hmm. don't if you're not passionate about what you're about to purchase or what you're mm -hmm. going after, then don't just wait till you really find that passion. You're like, all right, I know these breeds. They fit me like the you know what I like and what I hear about them. They fit me. So that's what I like. Right. You know, some guys, you know, um, Georgia Plucker is not for everybody. I mean, right. It's not, you know, so um if you're that type of guy, then that, that's the type of breed. So, you know, just pick something that you're really passionate about and that, you know, you get that like fuzzy feeling inside when you're about to make that purchase, you know? Um, and of course the relationships, uh, just go out there and talk to the breeders and, uh, you know, don't be in a rush to buy. Like I said, you know, some of those relationships, it was six years before I was able to get anything from them. Right. Um, so, you know, I know that's a long time to wait. <laughs> mm -hmm. And most people don't have the patience, but sometimes with Oriental fowl, you know, they're not, we're not breeding uh, thousands of birds, you know, right? And, uh, you know, got them in holding pins and teepees and tie cords and stuff like that for you to come select. So um, it's just a different type of bird, you know, um, right. different levels, there's different qualities, um, you know, so just take your time, uh, do your research. Um, you could reach out to me. I mean, uh, if I don't have what you're looking for, I definitely will point you in the right direction, you know, for sure. Mm -hmm. Tell me this, Jason, do, and, and I meant to ask you earlier about the breeding aspect. Do in Orientals, is it common to single mate or group mate? Is that what's common in, with the Orientals? Because they don't lay a lot of eggs already. So do, do y'all guys pretty much single mate or how do you know what's common in the Orientals? I mean, what's common for me is I'm going to single mate every time. I mean, there's rarely a pair of sisters, you know, I mean, you know, 
Um, yeah, I'm not trying to, um, you know, put multiple hens with a rooster because I want to know, like when I see something working, you're trying to figure out who your producers are, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. just like with any other fowl, um, nobody's, nobody has 10 ace brood cocks and 25 ace brood hens. <laughs> when you're talking about the upper echelon of every bird man's yard, um, it's very few that are producing that, you know, what, what, what's that guy, Chico Lopez say the golden vein. <laughs> so, you know, uh, there, there's a golden vein in everybody's yard. I, I don't, I don't believe that there's, you know, you know, for the most part, there's only very few, you know, really great, you know, producers, you know, so I like to single make everything to figure out who that is. Um, and, you know, like, like I was saying, my brood cocks, I forgot to mention this earlier, but, uh, I only use brood cocks and I'm honest truth. Uh, like I always pick one main brood cock out. Like I've decided, okay, he's gonna, that's the one I'm going to produce heavy with. And, uh, they're always a uh, double bred gargola. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking a half sister, half brother, and I'm trying to do, you know, the homogeneous type breeding where I'm breeding all the same traits, but I do have two outcrosses in there, but my main goal is to, you know, have the Georgia plucker. And to me, uh, those cocks bred that way, they're just as good in oriental fowl as any hybrid cross. And, uh, they actually produce, um, they produce well in, uh, the most consistent producers I've seen, you know, um, if they're just, you know, a 50, 50 cross, you know, it's just, the results are going to be, you know, a little bit over here and a little bit over there, but with right. those roosters bred like that half brother, half sister. And mm -hmm. I've also got some friends that they use that in, uh, you know, the little one inch Cuban fowl and uh, right. I heard breeders in American fowl using broodcocks that way. And uh, going back to um, that, like, uh, so when I do, when I do look for new blood, uh, I really not trying to go after anybody's stags or broodcocks. I'm just trying to try their hens out because I mm -hmm. like to put my broodcocks on top of it because they're packed with the traits that, you know, that I want and that I, that makes right. me satisfied. So that's the way I do it. And typically, you know, it depends, you know, some, some regions or cultures or, you know, different parts of the game feel like the hen is the most important. So it may be a little difficult, but, uh, most times I find that guys are willing to sell you a pullet or, you know, a well-bred hen. You know? No, that's definitely true. They usually have a bunch of those running around because all they focus and attention is going to be on stags and cocks and yeah. the, you know, and I guess maybe even like your buddy, he just went out there just grab one that was just laying on the ground end up being one of them one that lays the golden egg but <laughs> you know <laughs> lay that golden egg but so that's that's your that's your breeding strategy so you like to do half and half uh coming from the cock side different mothers different hens uh and then mating those together so half sister half brother double up on the cock side but the two hens are going to be the outcrosses correct yeah, that'll cross, you know, and of course, if you need to breed, uh, you know, pure, then, you know, you breed them, you know, pretty tight too. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, typically like when you're trying to make your hybrids, that's what I do. I like a brood cock bred like that off a different, uh, line hen, you know, like to try it that way. And uh, right. no matter what the hen is, you'll at least get some, uh, you know, some of the traits that you're looking for from the brood, uh. I've never seen a hen, this is just my opinion, I've never seen a hen really dominate uh, the breeding as far as style. Breeding program, uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. And Actually, when you, if you discuss it with some of the breeders that I've talked to, um, and what I've noticed myself, your best producing hens, so most people are going to take an ace cock, right? And they're mm -hmm. going to breed it to a hen. Um, mm -hmm. some of the best producing hens just follow the cock. So they don't really put any, they might put some color in it or some, you know, some right. of their traits, are, you know, I do believe hens are power. Now I do believe right. that. I believe that's where I get my power from. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but the best hens always follow the cock. So if you got an ace cock, even though he might be scatterbred or, you know, heterogeneous bred, uh, that right. hen will just allow his genes to go through. And if it's good, man, it, you know. You know what I'm saying, but basically. A yeah, no, I know. I know exactly what you're saying. I, yeah. Right, right. I just didn't want to interrupt you, but no, I know exactly what you're saying uh, on that. So that's kind of been your experience. And so so tell me this, uh, like Gargola, did, did you inbreed any anything off of him to make sure that if anything happened or later on down the road, you know, you build his replacement? Like, did you like double inbreed or breed, you know, Gargola um, yeah, to his daughter I mean, I, and then grant? 
I definitely bred the Saab mixes back to him. Um, I'm not a big fan of that type of breeding. I don't feel like, uh, I believe that half brother, half sister is a way more powerful, uh, mm -hmm. than the, you know, uh, father, daughter, mother, right. uh, you know, son. Uh, mm -hmm. I just feel like those birds, uh, get a little bit hurt too much by inbreeding, mm -hmm. but that half brother and half sister, like I'm saying, those, those are good enough that, you know, they're just as good as your hybrids in most cases. Um, gotcha. I will say I believe in breeding young fowl. So their prime, and this is my opinion to all animals, especially chickens, their prime mm -hmm. now for chickens now, their prime is from a year old to four years old. Uh, pretty much after four years old, the offspring are weaker. They're just not as good. And I bet you if you look back and there's, I'm sure there's exceptions to the rule, but a right. great producing performance animal Um if you look at when they were throwing, you know, what made them famous, it was when they're young and in their prime, probably like two and three years old. And then, you know, mm. there's always, uh, you see the advertisement, the last bred son of so-and-so. Right, uh, he right. Just, he just ain't, he ain't nothing, you know, and uh, I believe it's about <laughs> age. So I believe you need to keep it moving once they get a, you know, don't hold on to it. I mean, I know some, you know, some cocks, you know, of course, you know, Gargola, man, you know, I, I love that bird. But right. some cocks, man, you just got to you got to let it go when it reaches four years old. So my point that you're saying about trying to find a replacement is uh, you need to focus on like once you identify, OK, this is where my this is the golden vein of this. Mm -hmm. um, you need to focus on that and go in and get your inbreedings and find your replacement as soon as possible, because if you wait, but, you know, most people just outcross, outcross, outcross. And then before mm -hmm. you know it, you didn't have time to do your inbreeding. And now he's uh, five, six years old. And then, you know, yep. what's the quality going to be on those uh, inbreds now? It's already inbred, right. which already took it down a notch. And now you're the age got you. So it's like it's too late. So as and, soon and as that's you identify what, it, you know, go on and do it, you know. Go ahead and do it. And that, that's why I asked, because like I said, I know that's a very valuable bird to your breeding program. And I, I just wanted to know was, you know, would you put in plans in place? Because obviously, like you said, after four years old, there's going to be a whole different grade of roosters that he's going to be producing. So, um, but yeah, so you said as soon as you kind of identify the potential of, of, of a bird, you want to go ahead and start setting a breeding program up to be able to replicate that that one correct or replicate at least yeah. that those type of quality of birds yeah and uh you, you really don't have to as long as you keep the daughters and sons of them uh mm -hmm. like instead of like no, i'm not looking to oh i'm breeding them back to his granddaughter mm -hmm. or his daughters um i'm looking at all right the highest quality sons and daughters and i'm breeding those together to find my replacement and then you know when you gotcha. decide to do that you know it should be you know like if you can like i said the the earliest you can identify it um, hopefully it's three years old going and make all those breedings, you know, that you need to do with him to make sure you get the, you know, max him out. That's what I say. That's why I only choose one. I don't want to focus on 10 different brood cocks and I only get one or two batches from each. Like once I know that that's where it's at, uh, that's the only one I'm breeding. And, you know, if you, if you were to come to my yard, I mean, I would say 85% of all my birds carry Gargola, you know, and, uh, mm. So, I mean, I'm heavy on that bird, you know, and, and everything I own. Um, and like I said, you know, I, I am bringing, I always experiment, always keep your mind open uh, because mm -hmm. ne never get complacent, man. Because mm -hmm. the minute you think like, oh man, I don't need anything else. Mine are so good, man. Somebody else has already been eyeing you from back and uh, they just jet on by you with the new, yep. with the new thing. So you got to always... Um, you got to always stay, you know, on what's going on and always trying to mm -hmm. add something new. Like I said, bring about, you know, don't bring a bunch of experiments and get yourself confused. You know, you got your main right. thing and just bring, try a couple hens, you know, every season. And if it doesn't work, right. then, you know, just going to cut your losses and look again, you know, and, but you're just trying to find that, that next thing, you know, uh, that's going right. to help your breeding program. Now I'm not, I don't suggest to go buy something completely opposite from what you're breeding. You know, mm -hmm. you do like when I do look, uh, you know, fads change and phases go, but I'm still trying to look for, you know, maybe trying to increase, uh, you know, some speed or wrestling, but right. you're always trying to look for that, uh, you know, the, the stack, the genetics, you know, in your favor, you know, the, you know, to make that style as consistent as possible. So I, I do believe in, you know, don't, you're not going to try to bring in something completely opposite and it's just going to work. It'll, it'll be all right. over the place. Half of it's going to play like that and half it'll play like that. So just try to stay consistent 
and you know of course the same characteristics so when you're out there looking you're trying to look for something that carry the same characteristics of of what you pretty much already breeding and like you said you're not trying to look for something totally opposite because you just throw the whole program all over the place no but that makes a lot of sense as well and i'm glad that you mentioned that as far as keeping an open mind don't get complacent because there's guys out there the top breeders are always up in their game they're always yeah. they're always looking to produce better birds um and there's a lot of guys out there that's very complacent and they don't uh wake up to the reality of it until it's too late and what i mean yeah. is is you know uh it, it, by the time you realize you're behind you're about three to four years behind you know okay. and that was something i learned from talking with the guys in the philippines by the time you realize you're behind you're about four years behind it's going to take you about four years because you know everybody is trying to make better the next following year and i know that that term is is loosely to me is loosely used or, or overused you know you always want to make better birds than you made last year i truly believe that a lot of breeders are not doing that mm -hmm. i have seen a lot as far as they'll make adjustments when they stop getting results um and, and, and again, I think just like you, you always need to be trying to uh, trying to improve even when you're doing great. And I have seen some guys do great and don't try to improve uh, until they fall behind. And I know one famous breeder right now that's done that, and it's been almost three years now, and he's like Houdini, like nowhere to be in sight. He is nowhere yeah. near as competitive as he was. And I think, again, you get – complacent you know you have success yeah. for it's so long and... yeah it's complacency and sometimes you're just you're just you're just up there because you got a few hens and a special mm -hmm. cock man that's just putting it out there so yeah you know it just depends you know it's hard to, it's hard to maintain definitely is or yep you know like you said it's hard to keep you know improving that's the goal ultimately but it, it's really hard to continue to do that right that's exactly right and again i think that's what experiment come from because you don't really know. You know, I think that that's why experiment is so important. If you think about it, every industry in the world does it. That's what R&D is, research and development. Every industry is always doing it. You know, every big industry got a research and development department. And even though they might have the hottest selling product, they're still trying to create something even better. Same thing they do in other animals, horses and all that kind of stuff. They're always trying to up their game. Um, and I think, you know, like I say, what you're saying, that it makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, the newer generation really needs to understand how important it is to keep an open mind and to keep striving to get better because your competition is definitely out there trying to get better for sure. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of the way I feel about it. Um, but Jason, man, this has been an awesome interview. We are almost two hours, man, two hours. How, how do you think the two hours went, man? uh I, i'm i was nervous but i'm okay now and um <laughs> it, it's kind of fl flown by now you know yeah i told you brother i told you man it's been a great man we had an hour and 50 minutes now um and like i say i know it, it you know we had talked prior to man there's a lot of guys out there man that had made a positive impact on your program like you say you consistently talked about building the relationships um and it's a lot of guys out there that's been a part of your success um I'm, I'm i'm sure you would like to give those guys some shout outs man for you know at least thank them for the parts and the roles that they have played in in, in its success so far man so yeah. i know some guys that you want to shout out to <laughs> yeah i got a long list man but uh <laughs> you know out in uh east thailand i just want to um say what's up to team bud light give them a shout out Okay. Um, Sy, uh, CEO Jim, Woody, Zai. Mm -hmm. uh, shout out to Lethal, uh, Lip. Um, shout out to Team Redding. Um, mm -hmm. Shout out to uh, all the Turnio brothers, uh, Kerry. Um, you know, of course, you know he's like a, a father figure to me. Um, okay. Papa Dong, Papa Dong uh, really took mm -hmm. care of me. Want to give him a shout out. Um, and like I said, all the Turnio brothers, uh, Kit. You know, there's so many to mention, but like Kit, Lloyd, you know, Wasan, all of them, you know. Right. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people, all the brothers in the Philippines. I appreciate you guys, um, all the Indonesian brothers and uh, everybody here tonight that uh, hopefully I, you know, gave a little bit of knowledge and, um, you know, hopefully everybody can take something away from it, you know. I, 
I think the interview went great, man. I mean, I think the interview were great. I would love to have you back on again uh, because I know, like I say, it's still a lot that you have to share. Um, and obviously, we couldn't share it all because, like I say, I had to kind of you know move the interview on, man, because we start getting a lot of uh, uh, questions in the comment section, and we spent almost half the interview just on one topic alone. So I would love to bring you back on, man, because I know there's a lot. I'm sorry I had to cut that part short and move on, but I would love to bring you back on, man, because there's still a lot of unanswered questions um, about like all the history because you're the first guy we had on the show, man, that really got in depth with a lot of those different breeders and, 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 and um, the breeds that they had and, that, and the characteristics of those birds. Again, I think it was a very, very, very educational for the people that, that's watching. And I'm pretty sure – there's a lot that you wasn't able to share because of the, the time limit, but you know, would you be willing to come back on again and, and continue on kind of where we left off, especially when it comes to those breeders and bloodlines and, and characteristics um, to talk about the next time. Yeah, definitely, man. Anytime, anytime. So guys, listen, man, that's going to conclude our interview to the night. We had two hours, two hours. Like I said before, if y'all guys are watching from uh, YouTube, make sure you click that subscribe button and that bell notification so you don't miss Jason's next interview. Uh, we'll keep y'all guys posted on that. Um, if you're on Facebook and you're watching from Journey to the Pit page, please do me a favor and share it in the groups that you are uh, members of and share it to your page. We will greatly appreciate that. Um, I would like to thank Jason, man, for coming on. I greatly appreciate him coming on and sharing his knowledge. He is the first. Uh, he's the founding member of the Oriental uh, uh, Breeders coming on this show. He's the first one, man, and I think he did an excellent, excellent job. Shared a lot of information that I personally have never heard. Uh, it seems like a, some of the um, American Game Fire Breeders heard a lot of, um, well, not a lot, but heard of some of the breeders that he talked about. So I, I'm sure that y'all guys got a kick out of, of getting some education of, of, of some of the birds that y'all actually have from someone like Bob Rogers. Um, you know, that you mentioned, I see a lot of comments uh, talking about him. So we're going to have Jason come on again. Um, but again, guys, remember, share, share, share. Make sure you subscribe to that YouTube channel. Uh, we're going to post up probably Sunday or Monday. We'll post up our interview guests for next week. But again, guys, let's thank Jason. Jason, is there any way they can contact you um, if they got any further questions? And if you can, over the weekend or when you get time, if you can go into the comment section of this interview and maybe address some of those questions that we wasn't able to get to, which is a lot of them, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, no problem. I mean, anybody could shoot me a message through Facebook. Uh, I am pretty busy, so just be patient with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I definitely will try to get back with you, though. All right. I do got one so more guys, shout out. For, uh, go ahead. Uh, shout it out, brother. Shout it out. My buddy, Mike, man. I just want to say what's up, Mike. All righty, all righty, Mike. Well, Jason's giving you a shout out, man, from Journey to the Pit. And also, Jason, man, I really appreciate, man, the group that you have brought over, man. You have brought a huge following over from the Oriental community. Uh, most of those guys have never watched Journey to the Pit. So we would like to thank you from Journey to the Pit, man, for bringing us a whole group of, uh, of new viewers. Um, also, too, I would like to thank you for lining up um, some future interviews with some great breeders that you have already mentioned and reached out to them uh, per my request. Quest. I thank you for that. Um, and I like to thank those uh, future guests that actually they were watching tonight, you know, which I think was awesome. So they got an idea of how the interviews are going to go. But guys, uh, Jason, you know, like I say, you know, he offered to, um, you know, uh, reach out to some other oriental breeders that he thought would be great for journey to the pit that can bring another wealth of information from their perspective and their journey so i really really want to thank him for that and thanking those guys that he reached out to for accepting because i know they're watching uh tonight um and that's pretty much it guys so stay tuned um all y'all guys from the philippines indonesia thailand all the all the countries again that has never watched Journey to the Pit, all the new viewers that, that have never watched Journey to the Pit, I greatly appreciate y'all guys joining us. I hope you really enjoyed the show. Um, take the time, go to the YouTube channel and watch all the past shows. But we'll have more Oriental Breeders uh, along with American Game Fowl Breeders uh, on the show. So stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe and like the pages because I'll be posting up on Monday our next special guest for next Friday. So all of y'all have a great night. Stay focused, stay positive, and stay blessed, and I will talk to you all guys soon. Jason, you have a great and a blessed night, brother, and I'll talk to you soon.
Honor beyond, man, Jim. Thank you. Okay, brother.